Thank you, Dr. Hockfield. Ladies and gentlemen, as an Oregonian since 1979, it gives me special pleasure to celebrate the 2005 Lemelson MIT Prize Awards with you in the place I call home. A dozen years ago, Jerome Lemelson, known to his family and friends as Jerry, fulfilled a long-standing dream by starting the Lemelson Foundation. Over the course of a career as an independent inventor that began just after the Second World War, Jerry participated in a technological revolution that produced millions of new jobs and made our nation the world's economic leader. Jerry realized early on that America's leadership in science and technology was not the product of an economic manifest destiny resulting from our inherent national superiority or perhaps from divine intervention. Rather, he knew that our innovation economy grew out of soil nourished by wise laws and policies, a culture that encouraged inventors and entrepreneurs, and perhaps most importantly, an educational system that opened the doors to opportunity wider than at any time in our history. It is no accident that many of the most prominent names responsible for the explosion of technology-based businesses in the post-war period were returning veterans who took advantage of the educational benefits offered by the GI Bill, as did my father. Jerry believed we had to continually nurture a culture that supported inventors and innovators, especially among the young, in order to remain competitive in a rapidly globalizing economy. He was an economic nationalist, but largely because he wanted all Americans to share the benefits of our nation's prosperity. My father was not a religious man, but he did have a deep faith in America's promise. And so our family became, began the Lemelson Foundation with a mission at once simple and quite ambitious, to raise the profile of American inventors and encourage young people to value and seek careers as scientists, inventors, and technological entrepreneurs. The domestic programs of the Lemelson Foundation are all based on the core premises that inspired my father. The Lemelson MIT program, which culminates in tonight's event, celebrates America's leading inventors while also educating the media and the public about innovation. The newest aspect of the program, one we are quite excited about, involves teams of high school inventors called Invent Teams. The Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the Smithsonian Institution researches, documents, and elucidates the role of invention in shaping our economy and our culture. The National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance, or NCAA, with more than 220 college and university partners, provides thousands of students with the opportunity to work in student teams to invent and develop their entrepreneurial skills. The foundation do foundation's domestic partners also include the Lemelson Assistive Technology Development Center, that's a long one, at Hampshire College, which offers experiential education in developing technology for the disabled, the Lemelson program at the University of Nevada, Reno, that provides engineering students with entrepreneurial education, and the AMAN program, which offers inner city kids in Los Angeles access to cutting edge science education. Since entering the new century, the foundation has become, begun a new focus on supporting innovation in the developing world. The impetus for this new program, entitled simply Invention for Sustainable Development, grew out of our family's experiences traveling and living in the developing world. As many in tonight's audience already know, Indian software companies and Chinese high-tech manufacturers represent only one aspect of a rapidly globalizing economy. These success stories mask the reality that a majority of the world's citizens still lack access to the basics that many Americans take for granted, clean water, housing, health care, and jobs to support their families. And while billions lack the basics, global development is proceeding in a manner that is often environmentally unsustainable and that threatens our common future. In our travels, my brother Rob and I have witnessed firsthand the widespread poverty and suffering that to many Americans represents the entirety of that world. But we've also seen the enormous entrepreneurial drive and inventive potential in many developing countries. Yet inventors in poor countries often lack the opportunities and resources to bring their innovations to market or even to share them with others outside their own village. We started the foundation's new program with the hypothesis that empowering innovators at the local grassroots level can play a significant role in improving day-to-day -day life and creating economies that are both sustainable and more equitable. 
The Invention for Sustainable Development program has three primary goals. The program's first goal is to work with existing institutions in developing countries to create mentoring and support systems that assist individuals, inventors, and innovators, especially at the local or village level. We now have innovation centers called RAMP Centers, which is an acronym for Recognition and Mentoring Programs, starting in Indonesia and India, and we are working to establish a third center in Central America. Our hope is that these centers help to generate and support large numbers of inventors, especially among the young, and that their efforts ultimately have a ripple effect, leading to sustainable economic development, both within RAMP countries and also across national boundaries. The second goal of the new program involves direct grants to disseminate technologies that help people meet basic human needs and improve living standards. I'd like to highlight one example of the kind of organizations we are partnering with to meet this goal. Over the last year, we have begun working with International Development Enterprises, an NGO based in the U.S. and India that focuses on alleviating poverty by providing small farmers with low-cost technologies that help them increase their incomes. IDE views rural poor farmers as, in their words, natural entrepreneurs. Their model is market-based and relies heavily on local people whose intimate knowledge of their own lives provides the best template for innovation that truly solves problems. IDE engineers worked with Indian farmers to jointly develop very low-cost drip irrigation systems that sell for one-fifth the cost of comparable drip irrigation systems already on the market. Thus, a drip kit that formerly cost $100 and was out of reach of most small farmers now costs $20 because of IDE's work. This has enabled almost half a million families to move from subsistence to small-scale commercial farming, doubling their income, and allowing them to afford better food, health care, and education for their kids. Many such families have even been able to afford to buy small homes. And speaking in terms of sustainable development, drip irrigation saves enormous amounts of scarce water resources and actually helps farmers grow better quality cro crops while preserving precious topsoil. This is Earth Day, after all. Currently, less than 1% of farmed acreage in India is drip irrigated. IDE in intends to change that figure, and in one Indian state where IDE has been very active, as much as 46% of the total area is now being drip irrigated. The foundation awarded one grant to help the organization realize its long-term goal of mass dissemination of this micro-drip technology to 5 million small farmers over a decade. A second grant is fin financing the adaptation of microdrip for use in Central America and ultimately will lead to its dissemination to rural, smar rural small farmers in Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. We're proud to be assisting the work of groups like IDE, which is successful because it works from the grassroots and is based on a philosophy of empowerment rather than aid. As I mentioned earlier, culture plays a critical role in determining whether inventors succeed, and developing countries vary tremendously in terms of their support for innovators. Our international program's third facet involves recognizing and rewarding in inventors and innovators in highly visible forums in the developing world. Here we aim to provide role models and examples of success that can influence public attitudes towards invention. A few moments ago, I cited the burgeoning Indian software industry and China, China's rapidly growing manufacture, manufacturing sector as success stories in the developing world. We know that innovation needs the right public policies, a supportive cultural context, and access to capital to flourish in any culture. Yet the most important requirement for innovation to flourish in today's world is a highly educated workforce. To make my next point, I will borrow some, stati some statistics from a speech given recently by Bill Gates on the state of public education in America. Gates noted that while American fourth graders are among the top students in the world, by the time they are in the eighth grade, they're in the middle of the pack. And by the twelfth grade, they score near the bottom of all industrialized nations. Furthermore, while our best students are the best in the world, we are failing to prepare the vast majority, especially low-income and minority students, to succeed in this century. In stark contrast, China graduates six times the number of students in engineering as the U.S., while India graduates one million more students overall from college than we do. While these last numbers do not tell the whole story, they do indicate troubling trends for the future of our knowledge-based economy. Economists tell us that global development is not a zero-sum game, that a richer China and India do not mean a poorer America. While this is true in theory, in the real world it depends very much on how well our educational system, and hence our economy, adapt to a rapidly changing world. 
It also, of course, depends on wise policies emanating from Washington, D.C., but that is the topic for another speech. <laughs> Gates highlights what he calls the three R's, rigor, relevance, and relationships, as part of his recommendations for reforming American public education. Rigor defined as setting high standards and challenging students. Relevance meaning offering courses that relate to students' lives. And relationships assuring the presence of adults who push kids to succeed, who look out for them, and who act as mentors. While thinking about my remarks, I realized that the Lemelson Foundation has been working with our partners from the beginning to educate young people about invention and innovation in ways that closely track the three R's. Teaching kids about invention and entrepreneurship means setting high standards for students and challenge, challenging them to focus and integrate their knowledge of science and other disciplines. It means giving them opportunities to develop skills that they will find exceptionally relevant in a world where workers will either need to change careers frequently or will need to start their own businesses to achieve a measure of independence from economic dislocation. And it gives them the chance to work in teams with inventors, teachers, and business people who track their progress and act as mentors. Oregon provides, in some important ways, ways, a microcosm of the nation in terms of the challenges facing its educational system. It is common knowledge among educators, policymakers, and the business community here that we are largely failing to provide our state's young people with the skills needed to succeed. Oregon high-tech businesses often look elsewhere for skilled employees, and there is an enormous gap between the best urban high schools and most rural high schools. As an Oregon-based foundation, we recognize the need to develop new educational models to help meet these enormous challenges. That's why I am pleased to announce a new foundation initiative focused exclusively on Oregon that begins with two facets. The first, initiating invention teams at Oregon high schools, especially those in low-income neighborhoods, and also at six or seven universities under the auspices of the NCAA. And the second, working to better prepare students for technology-based careers by bringing together stakeholders from all levels of education as well as the business community and policymakers. Foundation funds will help catalyze creation of a new strategy to advance education in engineering that starts at the high school level, continues into the university level, and hopefully culminates in careers with Oregon companies. We intend to continue and expand on this effort in the coming years. Up. Thank you. You know, one of the great advantages of charitable foundations, the way they're structured in our society, is that they are freed from the constraints that often limit other institutions. They do not have to answer to shareholders, to the marketplace, or to voters. They are free to experiment, to explore different paths, and like inventors, to envision a new future and work to bring it to life. And yes, they can even fail, which after all is part of the learning process. In short, they can act as catalysts for change, as we hope to continue to do both at home or and abroad. Thank you very much.